Hey guys, Ari, here we are in part two of the NACOR exam prep video series here. Again, like I mentioned in the video, and you probably saw at the end of the last one, uh, I didn't expect to make two videos. However, the first one ran so long, I just thought it'd be a lot easier to kind of break it up in, in that way that you can like jump into different parts of it. It's a lot easier if it's in two separate videos. So if you're just stumbling upon this video uh, and you haven't watched part one, I strongly suggest you start with part one. Uh, just because we go over mindset and we go over kind of the premise of everything first uh, and then you could kind of come back to this video and jump into part two. So again, like I mentioned, in this particular video, we're covering the contact lens portion of the exam and exactly all the things that you should be kind of getting yourself prepped for. And again, we're doing this uh, with two weeks left, a little bit less than two weeks actually, before uh, this session of the NACOR exam is happening. Uh, so, you know, it's it's go time. It's time to really get all of these concepts hammered out and it's gonna help you kind of prioritize what you should be studying and what you should be kind of leaving to the side uh, so that you can really focus on what's the most important stuff. All right, I'll, let's jump into it. And uh, again, if you have any questions about anything that's going on here, drop a comment in the comment section and I will get back to you as soon as possible, I recognize. How, uh, how stressful, if you, if you run into an issue, how stressful it can be. And I wanna make sure that I answer these questions right away. I will be keeping an eye on all notifications uh, so that I know that somebody's in need and I can help them out. All right, enjoy the lecture and uh, good luck with everything. Okay, here we are in part two, the contact lens portion of the NACOR exam. Um, I didn't expect to do it in two parts. So uh, this is, well, we're doing this on the fly um, and we're kind of, you know, figuring things out as we go. So anyways, uh, if you are jumping into this lecture and you're wondering where part one is, it will be linked in the description. Um, I highly recommend you start with part one, uh, which covers the eyeglass portion of the exam. Uh, you know, we go through some mindset stuff and other things that I think really tie well into this one that I'm not going to be going over again in this part. Uh, we're going to try to get through this one a little bit quicker because I, I think that you're best suited to be spending more time studying and applying than listening to me uh, talk about this stuff. So, uh, again, check the description below if you're jumping into this. If you're coming from the eyeglass side, all right, let's keep going and uh, let's jump into this part of the exam, which doesn't have to be scary. Everybody kind of you know, it treats the contact lens portion like it's the hardest part. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably because you get less exposure to it. And I know that the pathology and all of the anatomy stuff scares people, um, but it doesn't have to. And the interesting thing about this exam this year is that some parts have been cut, some of the harder parts, some of the more nerve wracking parts have been cut. And I'll talk about a few of those things as well. So, uh, all right, let's jump into it and let's see if we can get through this relatively quickly. All right, following the theme of the other lecture when we talked about the eyeglass stuff, we're going to go through each section one by one and talk about, uh, you know, the things that we should be covering in our studies and, pre and preparation. So section one covers keratometry and RX interpretation. Um, in this section, you get two case scenarios and you're required to do a few things. First, you're, you're going to calculate uh, RGP lenses. Um, both flatter and steeper, uh, and you're gonna and and basically you know give uh, an answer of what final power you would order, and then you would also do the same thing with a soft lens. And in this section, you're actually doing the keratometry as well. So there's a few changes this year because of COVID that actually work out to your favor. Um, so I think this is an opportunity where students may have struggled at this uh, in the past. This is an opportunity to rock this. So uh, let's take a look at a few things to consider. First, um, things like alignment fit versus flatter versus steeper. So with an RGP lens, uh, you, you know, ideally, best case scenario, if you were fitting a spherical cornea, you would ideally want alignment fit, which is basically fitting on K. However, what this is gonna be testing is the fact that if, you know, in the case study, if you're given uh, a prescription that has some corneal astigmatism, um, then you're going to have to fit based on the nomogram. So they basically want, they're gonna give you the nomogram, they're gonna give you uh, the prescription, they're gonna give you all these, all the information you need to do a fitting. You have to recognize that, you know, based on the nomogram, if there's some corneal cylinder, you're either gonna to have to fit flatter or steeper. It wants you to understand, it wants, the examiner is gonna to wanna to see 
that you understand those principles, right? So, um, the, and this again, like I mentioned, is the idea of correcting astigmatism with a spherical lens. Um, these things kind of fall out of the equation if you're doing like a toric lens and stuff like that. Um, those calculations become a little bit more, in, in, you know, in depth and intricate. And then quite frankly, they're not even usually done by you. They're done by a contact lens expert at like Boston and, and things like that. Um, you still need to recognize when, uh, you know, uh, an RG, when the um, uh, front torque, back torque, bi torque, when those things need to be used. But in this particular scenario, we're talking about spherical lenses and exactly how you're going to use them to correct uh, corneal astigmatism. Um, so you've got to remember that the tear lens is going to impact your final power here. So remember the concepts that, you know, when you're looking at the nomogram, if you're feeling flatter, a flatter lens is going to create a minus tear lens. If you're if you're fitting steeper, a steeper lens is going to create a plus tear lens. Though and and how much? Well, by the amount uh, that you're fitting flatter or steeper. So, for example, if you're fitting half a diopter flatter, you're going to be creating a minus 0.5 uh, diopter tear lens. If you're if, if you're fitting half a diopter steeper, you're going to be creating a plus 0.5 diopter tear lens. Those things need to be taken in consideration when you're doing your final power. So if you're creating a plus tier lens and you're fitting a minus lens, well, then your prescription is going to have to be more minus to compensate for that plus tier lens. And on the opposite, if you're fitting a minus uh, tier lens and a minus lens, you're going to have to, your final power is going to be less minus because your, your minus tier lens is actually uh, contributing to that overall minus. These are concepts, and I know, I know one of the comments I might get here is that, well, you're not showing us this stuff. We don't have a lot of time here. We only have two weeks left. These are things that you can, you know, in your notes, uh, there's plenty of opportunity to review these concepts. Right now, this is more of a review to try to get you prepared for it. This is only one section. This is something that you might want to practice a little bit um, in order to get a little bit better at it. And also remember your concepts of MOR, you know, because all these things could come up in this little case study, in this case scenario, they call it. Um, where you're given, you know, you're given the, the prescription, you're given the case, you're given um, the nomogram, so you can decide based on the prescription and case uh, what you should be fitting, and then you could be given like an MOR where it states that uh, based on uh, after you've done all this fitting, uh, the person actually takes, you know, half a diopter of plus. <clears throat> what is going to be your final order. So these, this is a very kind of intuitive uh, practice, practical thing um, that that they're asking, um, and it's something that I mean, if we were fitting RGPs on the regular, which I know this is a whole can of worms, I don't, I don't want to get into it. No one ever fits RGPs anymore. However, these are concepts that would be applied uh, in this type of principle. When it comes to Part B, where you're going to be doing the keratometry. Um, very simple thing, make sure that your eyepiece is well calibrated when you're looking in there. Um, make sure that uh, you know your mire is coming clear and that you're well calibrated. Um, now the change here is that you're not actually doing a patient um, in this year's exam, which is a huge bonus um, because I'm assuming you guys have done plenty of keratometry now to this point. It can be a little hard sometimes if the patient's not cooperating well. Sometimes it's hard to find the mires. Sometimes it's hard to keep a stable image if they have dry eyes. You're always asking them to blink and stuff like that. Imagine you don't have to deal with any of that stuff this year. The, the You don't have to ask the steel ball to blink. You don't have to ask them to position themselves properly. Everything is perfect. So this is a huge, huge perk of this year. Make sure you nail this, right? Um, so think about the calibration ball and you know what I hate saying this because like I, I'm gonna feel stupid if I'm wrong um, but just based on my knowledge of optics and and things that are available this should be a spherical reading right like I, I couldn't imagine that they have toric steel balls and even so how would they arrange this thing properly who knows I mean I, I really I would expect that you should be getting a spherical reading on this so it should be 42 by 42 44 by 44 or anything in between you know it shouldn't uh again if you're getting like a majorly toric reading here um then i i would record that however i would expect you to get a spherical reading here and again this is a huge opportunity here this is super easy uh to 
super easy to get compared to a patient. Um, you know, even the axis sometimes, right? So, you know, and it's a stressful thing for a lot of people when you're taking K's is when you're turning the axis drum on the keratometer, sometimes it can be really hard to really differentiate, you know, whether you're getting this thing straight or not. All of that is gone with a spherical steel ball. So, um, you know, again, you know, when this can be stressful, at least this is one thing that you can stress yourself less about saying like, oh, this is going to be a heck of a lot easier uh, to do than it normally would have been. So concepts to review, um, obviously the nomograms, you should be familiar with them. Again, you don't have to commit them to memory, just like the ANSI charts we didn't have to. Uh, however, you want to make sure that you can navigate these things pretty easily and it doesn't look foreign, right? So when you're looking at, and even if they were to throw you a curveball and the nomograms different than what you've looked at, at least you have an idea of how to navigate these things and exactly how to apply them. So make sure that you review the nomograms and you um, and you have a, a sense of familiarity with how all this stuff works. Um, review, you know, the difference between alignment fit, flat fit, and steep fit. Uh, of course, if you're giving a cornea that is not that has no corneal astigmatism, has no refracted astigmatism, has no uh, and um, is like an ideal fit. I mean, alignment fit is always on K is always the preferred method. However tying in with the nomograms as well, flat fit and steep fit is sometimes necessary based on the, um, the dynamics of the lens, right? So uh, of course, review those things so that you're extremely familiar with it. MOR principles, right? Um, you know, you, you might not going to get an opportunity to do a whole lot of them. And in, in this section, you're not actually being asked to do an MOR. However, you know, remember the principles of uh, MOR, you know, how you're going to fog a little bit first so that, you know, to disable a, the accommodative reflex, little things like that. And you know, you don't have to get too deep into that because the reality is, like I've said, you want to focus on things that you're actually going to be asked. However, you don't want to all of a sudden see a case scenario where there's an MOR done and, and, and you're like, well, what, what, what do I do with that? Um, you know, get ready to be able to apply things like the nomogram and an MOR and then knowing exactly what you should order as the final power. Uh, know how to, you know, how to calibrate a keratometer. This is not, you're not going to be asked to calibrate it, but you might be asked, how would you calibrate it? Um, this is one of those questions that have been followed, that, that have followed exam <laughs> through the exams year after year. I did my exam like almost 15 years ago and uh, it was asked and I still have students today who get asked. So remember that you would use the, the exact calibration balls that you're given, except for the fact that it would be known. So you want to tell them that, you want to make sure you tell them that I would have a calibration ball of known power because if it's not known I mean you can't calibrate it so let's say it's a 42 diopter radius ball um, then you would mount it and you would put you know you would measure it and you would see if it measures 42 if it didn't you would then take an allen key loosen the power drum on your keratometer and uh, and adjust it to 42 because the ball's known. Anyways, this is a pretty easy one. So you wanna make sure you can articulate that, right? I just, I, I think I did an okay job of articulating it just now. You just don't wanna be like, ah, uh, you know, I'd take a ball and I would I would put it in. And you wanna make sure that they understand that, you know, cause it's, it's no secret that everyone knows this question's coming. You wanna be able to you know, answer it intelligently and articulately. All right, uh, good exercises for this kind of stuff. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, one of the best things that I would recommend, because you're not going to be fitting, I doubt you're going to be fitting uh, a bunch of RGP patients in the next two weeks. So, and that can actually be a little stressful for a lot of students because a lot of them may not even have actually fit a single one, um, nor are they likely to fit one, you know, in the time remaining before the exam. However, great thing to do. So if you work in an office that has either uh, contact lens files, uh, or doctor files. These are two awesome things. Grab a stack and go through them. What, you, what you're looking for is you need to have the patient's prescription and you need to have the patient's case. So, and you can sit there and you can bring some of these home. I mean, I mean privacy laws and things like that and make sure that you're complying with things. You know, you don't want to be taking, stealing files and bringing them home. But anyways, even if you're doing it in the office, it doesn't really matter. Um, do it whichever way you see fit. However, take the prescription take the case and then take your nomogram and do your own little case study on every single one of them. What would I fit? Um, make sure that you say things like, you know, I would actually, ideally I would fit a, a back torque, a front torque, a bi torque based on what, what we're looking at. However, in this particular case, you want to be looking for, um, you know, situations where you would likely be fitting a spherical lens and you practice applying the nomogram, calculating the tear lens, um, and then figuring out what the final power would be. And then if you want to throw it up, to, you know, kick it up a notch, 
then you could even say, oh, what, or you can have somebody, you know, uh, a colleague be like, well, what if it was a minus 0.5 uh, MOR? And then you could start applying these little principles um, in order to kind of practice. And you've got all the things you need in your office to be able to practice. You don't necessarily have to be seeing patients to do so. Um, and I just talked about it, you know, even though... You're not likely to be asked this in it. You could be asked in a multiple choice question, things like that. What the best uh, RGP is for the, uh, you know, in the situation, whether it's spherical, back torque, front torque, bi torque. I, you know, I, I want to go into this, but it's just like time. I don't want to go. You know, we, we could spend an hour on this. However, review those principles, right? About you know the concept of how much corneal cylinder. Uh, a spherical lens can can mask with the tear lens uh, where it's more appropriate with a back toric lens and front toric lens and bi toric lens and these things are going to have to do with between your relationship of refracted astigmatism versus corneal astigmatism you know understanding the difference between um, residual and corneal and things like that <laughs> you know these are these are all things that are important to know however they may not apply to these particular questions uh, if you're running if you're, you're having a have hard time with it focus primarily on your nomograms and fitting uh, you know spherical lenses and then if you uh, if you have time you you know you can fit colleagues I, I would have hoped that you would have done this by now however uh, if you feel up to it do a full fitting you know from start to finish you grab the refraction, grab the prescription, and then go off to the races. Take the Ks, uh, you know, do the base curve selection based on those Ks, based on the nomogram, do an MOR, do the final calculations of what you would order. I would suggest, however, if you haven't done this yet, and if you're running low on time, do the, the pull the files part, because, you know, it's, you're not actually, this is a theoretical part of the exam, and you're not actually going to be fitting an RGP in the exam um, this year anyways. So, you know, if you want to make the best use of your time, if you feel like this will help, go for it. Otherwise, do the pull the files game. Um, and perform keratometry on everyone you can. I know I already said you're only doing a steel ball, but I think just like, you know, practicing and having the keratometer in your hands. And if anything, if practicing on a patient, like I've mentioned, is harder, then if you do this enough, you should be an absolute rock star when you get to the steel ball. So do it uh, that way. Practice, practice, practice. Um, and uh, this should make this part of the exam a heck of a lot easier. All right, now we're getting into the uh, second section of the contact lens exam, the pathology and contact lenses. I hate this part of the exam. Not that I hate the pathology, quite the contrary. Um, I like this stuff as far as as the, the topic. I hate what it does to students because most students and, you know, those of you listening to this and watching it might actually fall into this boat and I don't blame you because it happens to everybody. They focus so heavily on this portion and it so shouldn't be that way. Um, well, the reality is, is that the OAC and NACOR and stuff like that kind of make it this way um, when really there's so much more we should be covering. Anyways, nonetheless, I would not stress so much about this because the um, I find most students, because they stress about this, they get really good at recognizing pathology and it's almost disappointing because half the slides they give you are absolute junk and you can barely make them out and it's not really a very good indicator of um, of how good you are. So if you've actually touched on pathology quite a bit uh, already, which I'm I'm confident you probably have, my, my guess is that you're pretty proficient at it um, and studying this more and more and more and more is not necessarily going to make you more prepared for the exam. Because it's kind of, I mean, I, I hate to speak poorly of this stuff. And, and believe me, I've bitten my tongue many a times before. However, the layout of this exam and the pathology side is horrible. Um, so it's slated against you. So not, not to discourage you, it's just that don't spend hours and hours and hours on pathology. Uh, it's not worth it um, because it's just going to be disappointing when you get to it. Um, but nonetheless, let's still touch on some of this stuff, things to consider. Um, Focus on contact lens related stuff, you know, things like macular degeneration, carcinomas, um, you know, uh, cataracts to a certain degree. Those things aren't that important when it comes to contact lenses. Um, I would focus primarily that, you, you know, if you're going to do, you know, in our, in our programs at Modern Optician, we have hundreds of pathologies that we go through, uh, both in the, in, in, the, in, in the workbooks as well as the flashcards. Um, these things are all important to know. I'm, don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm saying, but I would focus my, my efforts primarily on things that would affect contact lens wear, which I wish the exam would. Um, and and I, I'd say this 
in hopes that that's the way the exam is, is usually going to go, that they're going to focus on things that actually apply here, um, as opposed to obscure uh, neurological conditions or things like that, which really have very little to do with contact lens. Um, the more you review, the better you'll be, right? Go through it over and over again. That's where flashcards come in really handy. If you see it over and over and over again, and you could just say it right away, then great. You know, that's going to be better. Um, you know, the, again, it's the more you see, the better you are at recognition. Um, general versus specific, right? The reason I say this is because there's certain conditions that are very, very general, such as keratitis, right? So, <clears throat> you, can, you know, if, if, if you see a cornea that has problems with it, you can almost always say there's some kind of keratitis involved. I mean, especially if it's a, a condition that happened recently that's acute uh, or even chronic. I mean, <clears throat> keratitis is inflammation. There's so many different types of keratitis that can happen. Um, so I don't know how to advise you on this. I mean, I've seen slides, to be honest with you, where I look at it and I think, wow, that's what they want here, right? Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where you can't go wrong with general sometimes if you're really not sure. Um, however, there's very some there's some very specific things, you know, um, as far as very specific patterns. So it's you know start recognizing patterns. You know, dendritic ulcers from like herpes infections is one of those things where if you're looking you know, you're looking at specific things like any kind of stippling or anything like that on the cornea, you could say, yeah, it's keratitis. But, you know, if you see a big dendritic ulcer, that's what they're looking for, right? So the, the key here, and I know I'm not being like super helpful in this, and I'm sorry. However, the key is look for very specific stuff first. And if you find that you're like, I don't know, then go general. Right. Um, again, the reason I'm saying this is because I feel like the slides suck and I hate this part of the exam and I feel sorry for you to have to go through it. However, we still have to prepare for it. And um, I'm pretty confident every student I encounter is usually pretty good at the pathology slide slides. And I feel like the fact that they're not always rocking it is not their fault. It's it's the exam's fault because um, I'm always impressed on how well these students prepare yourself included likely uh, for the pathology. And it's still a stress point. Right. Um, another thing is focus on uh, things like allergies, uh, handling problems, cleaning problems, foreign bodies, etc. It stands to reason uh, that we should be looking at these kind of things because as contact lens fitters, as optician contact lens fitters, we're not it's not within our scope of practice to be doing, um, to be diagnosing problems, uh, especially anatomical issues, um, you know, like major pathologies that you can get yourself into some hot water if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to, um, you know, diagnose and give poor advice. And also you can't treat anyway. So what are we doing with this kind of stuff, right? So the main thing I would be focusing on is you know, of course, you could do a broad brush stroke on this and cover everything, but things like allergic reactions, handling problems, cleaning problems, uh, you know, intolerances to solutions, having foreign bodies caught between the lens and the eye, uh, you know, having, um, you know, corneal abrasions due to foreign bodies, things like that. I would focus primarily on these things because, you know, I'm going to go out and on a limb and give the NACOR like, you know, a little bit of uh, the benefit of the doubt that they're going to try to focus on things that are more applicable to a, a optician cocktail lens. Fitter. Problem is, is that a lot of the times you get a little bit of uh, a little bit of pride involved here, and, and and they're trying to test you on things that are not necessarily applicable. You know, listen, just focus on the most important stuff, and I think you're going to be best suited that way. So the concepts to review, obviously, pathology slides, um, ha how to handle common issues, whether to refer or not to refer. That is the main thing that I would be looking at, not how to treat. You know, don't focus on how to treat a bacterial versus a viral infection, things like that. This is not within your scope. Focus on, you know, the difference between a pathology that can still be fit over top, whereas something that can't. You know, recognize that you can fit over top a cataract, albeit, you know, you may not improve vision, uh, but you can't fit over keratitis. Um, things like a pinguicula, right? Can, you know, as long as it's not interfering with the lens, a pterygium might be a little bit more uh, of a touch and go based on, you know, causing irritation and causing inflammation and potentially causing keratitis. Uh, based on, you know, uh, interacting with an elevated surface. Little things like that are much more important to the contact lens fitter as opposed to recognizing some obscure, like, Krugenberg, uh, you know, spindles. Although, things like that, that is benign uh, and you can fit over top. So, little things like I would focus on whether or not you can fit or not fit, not whether or not you can treat, right? 
And good exercises are definitely flashcards. Uh, we have flashcards in our program. Uh, however, if you create your own flashcards, that's pretty easy to just print a whole bunch. Go go on Google, do a whole bunch of, you know, find a whole bunch of, of slides. They're not always 100% accurate though, so be very careful. Um, however, going over these things over and over again is definitely the best thing to do. Uh, consultation with colleagues. If you have a doctor in the office, it's not a bad idea to get their take on all these pathologies and whether or not you would, and I would focus once again on whether or not you can fit over top of it as opposed to how you would treat it. Don't go down a rabbit hole with, oh, you know, I would treat this with an anti-inflammatory, then I would treat it with an antibiotic or a combo, and it doesn't matter. This is one of the things that we're looking at. You want to see whether or not this is something that is dangerous or that it should be referred, and that would probably best suit you to prepare for this portion of it. And of course, repetition. Just repeat over and over and over again to the point where you're sick and tired of seeing these slides. You're probably there already because most students, that's what they focus on the most for this portion of the exam and yet we're only in section two we have three other sections right so you know my biggest advice here is repeat and do it over and over again but don't stress about this uh you're going to do fine with this section all right speaking of other sections and what's important to be looking at uh section three here verification and design is one that i find is extremely overlooked and it's something that i think a lot of students lose uh some grades here um, maybe because they're focusing too much on pathology. Um, however, th in this section here, you have to neutralize, you have to neutralize the back vertex power of uh, soft lenses and hard lenses as well. And you also have to take some other measurements. This is one that uh, very interestingly here in the past has been a huge problem area for a lot of students. And that was in taking the radioscope measurements. Um, and I have some pretty, some pretty, you know, um, passionate thoughts around that, that I'm going to spare you because we're already running long on this. Um, however, I hate the radioscope. I think it's a, it's like becoming a dinosaur in the industry. And the fact that they decide to test students on this is absolutely unfair seeing as how with the exception to the students at uh, Georgian and maybe Seneca, you can't find a radioscope. It's like, you know, it's like Loch Ness Monster. Uh, however, anyways, nonetheless, great thing is that we're not actually doing radioscope this year. And I hope, 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 hope that this is an indication of things to come, that they will no longer uh, have the students take measurements on this dinosaur piece of equipment. How, anyways, why don't we go into a few things here? However, you're still going to have to measure a couple of other things. So there are things to consider here. Um, when you're measuring the, uh, the contact lens cup down, you know, place the, uh, the lens cup down on the, uh, on the lens meter, right? You're doing back vertex power. So same way you would do a lens, right? You're doing, uh, I'm sorry, the same way you would do like a pair of glasses, spectacles, right? You put it cup down. Um, now, Practice, practice, practice. This is something that I don't see a lot of students practicing and it's challenging. And um, a lot of the times what ends up happening is that a few days before the exam, they're like, oh yeah, we should probably do this. And then they realize how hard it is and how much it sucks. And then it creates a lot of stress. So do a lot of lenses. Um, the, uh, you know, if you don't have any RGPs, it's gonna be a little harder. However, fortunately, RGPs are a little bit easier to read than soft lenses in my opinion anyway so um practice on soft lenses and if you have rgps definitely practice on those as well make sure to recognize spherical versus toric right um if there's a toric lens in there uh if you're seeing cylinder you may want to record it because i wouldn't put it past them to do a uh toric lens in that bunch um soft lenses they should be uh not wet but not dehydrated either uh you shouldn't have too much liquid on the lens because or any really you gotta pat it dry uh with a non-lint kind of you know cloth or something of the sort um because the the liquid will mess with the optics however if it's dehydrating you're not gonna get good optics either so basically you gotta hydrate this thing uh and then put it on a nice and you know pat it dry put it on and then measure it quickly um, to be able to get the best possible optics on there. And again, I just talked about no radioscope. Woohoo, big, uh, awesome turn of events here. And I don't have to talk about it because, you know, we'd have to talk about, you know, the different types of radioscopes, whether we're going base, to, base down to up and up to down and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we don't have to talk about any of that stuff, which is super awesome. Um, and so this is an opportunity here to get the, this, this section three under your belt without having to worry about the radioscope. But with that said, um, we want to make sure that all the other measuring devices are, um, 
are being used properly. So if you're using like the diameter gauges um, and the thickness gauges, make sure you measure to the nearest 0.1 millimeter and you make sure that you take your time because these are things that you probably don't have in your office because these also are absolute dinosaurs. And you know, if you haven't had an opportunity to use these at workshops or things like that, you're going to have to go in on it kind of blind. And again, it sucks and I'm sorry and I don't think it's right. However, we got to move on and we got to do it. Um, take your time with it and um, and make sure you measure it nice and, and slowly and deliberately. Uh, so as far as uh, the lens designs, uh, I would say that I would focus primarily on uh, lens modifications, right? So things like uh, lens truncation, lens uh, fenestration, uh, those are definitely things I would expect to be on there, those types of modifications. Uh, scleral lens, that one's pretty easy to uh, recognize. Uh, soft perm, the X-chrome lens, which is red, you know, things like that. So uh, there's not a whole lot of things for them to test you on here. I would definitely expect things like modifications to be one of the big ones. So concepts you should review. Um, is uh, the lens measurement chapters in your notes uh, or your textbook, you know, whatever textbooks you're using for contact lens, every single one of them will have a section on verifying lenses. Uh, lens design modification, like I was saying, fenestrations, truncation, soft perm lenses, scleral lenses, you're going to have some of those in there. Um, you know, it says that the candidate will also be required to identify the lens design of three gas permeable lenses. I would be willing to bet that, you know, fenestration, truncation, those kind of things will be in there. Uh, there's only so much they can ask you, and these are important things that they should be asking you about. So I would expect them to be there. Uh, good exercises uh, is literally to measure as many trial lenses as possible. Um, if you have trial kits, measure soft, measure, me, you know, measure rigid. If you don't have any rigid, just focus on soft, measure spherical, measure toric. Realize that the images suck, so play around with it until you get it, and then you know try to do almost like the the secret uh, you know job game where you just you know don't know what the power is and try to guess at it. Do it over and over and over again until you kind of find your sweet spot where you're doing it well. Remember, this is not easy. However, the more you practice, the better you'll get at it, and it's something that um, especially with the radio scope out of this section this year, I think you can really you know nail this part of the exam if you just put a little bit of practice into it. All right, well, section four is uh, the insertion and removal part, which is been which has been eliminated this year uh, due to COVID, uh, COVID, sorry, COVID protocol. Uh, so this one we could go through pretty quickly. Uh, you should still know how to do this stuff, right? Because I wouldn't put it past them. There's still a way, there are still ways to ask you uh, whether or not, or like kind of test whether or not you're proficient at this stuff. Uh, this is, however, a big bonus that you don't have to do this because though it's extremely important and I think everybody should be tested on this stuff, uh, it was definitely a stressful one for most students because um, you know, if things can go wrong. You're always worried about what if I can get the, the lens in the person's eye? What if I can get it out? What if I, what if I hurt them? Uh, what if they can tell I'm shaky? You know, what if, you know, this was one of the biggest kind of nerve wracking ones. So, you know, again, if you're stressing out about this exam, this is a, a nice little thing to kind of ease your stress a little bit that at least you don't have to do the insertion and removal this year. Um, so, so like I said, not part of the exam. So let's just move on real quickly. Things that you should probably be reviewing just in the event that there's some kind of theory question that you're asked. Because keep in mind that, you know, the handbooks, uh, the handbook that we're using is based on normal years. So, you know, they've probably had some, 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 or they've obviously had some omissions uh, in this exam based on COVID protocol. However, they could add some little things. So it doesn't hurt to kind of review this kind of stuff. Rem you know, your proper insertion and removal of RGP soft and scleral lenses could be, you know, you never know. There could be multiple choice questions based on this. So make sure you review all of it, even though we're not expected to do it. Um, as far as good exercises, normal years, I would say, um, you would practice the skill, but this time around, I say focus on other things. Okay. So obviously, like I said, we can go over, you know, real briefly about insertion and removal, things like, you know, lens, uh, len, uh, Liddy versions and things like that. Just know the principles. But again, we're, we're two weeks away from the exam and, you know, we got to decide what we're going to focus our efforts on. This is definitely not one of the things you need to be focusing on. Uh, just, you know, briefly go over it just in case you're asked different things about it. Uh, however, uh, not really part of your plan right now for the next two weeks. And finally, uh, section five, follow-up, which is a big one, really a big one. And this is one that definitely has a lot of emphasis on it. So you definitely have to focus 
on your follow-up stuff. So in this section, uh, it's theoretical, and you're given six case scenarios uh, in which you have to either identify a condition or a problem, um, and it, probably a series of questions as well as like the solution or you know what what you should be doing as a result of of figuring out this problem. Um, you're also going to uh, have to do a six month follow up on a live model. This is going to be something about uh, you know they're going to discuss things like. Um, like you know uh their their experience uh you're gonna you're gonna be asking them questions like their you know their routine making sure they've been complying uh you know how how the lens has been performing and things like that so the follow-up is definitely a huge part and the other reason it's a huge part is because this is the section when you're talking about your slit lamp uh exam now the slit lamp exam i'm going to talk about in 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 the, the rest of the slide is something that um it can hang some people up a little bit. However, it's not really that hard, especially if you study properly for it. Um, and again, I don't even know if, if this year they're going to be doing it on a live model or not. However, prepare yourself uh, in the event that they are, because you know, you know, in a slit lamp exam, you don't actually have to touch the patient. So I'm wondering if they're just going to continue to do it with a live model. Uh, so prepare yourself for that. Anyways, let's jump into things to consider. Uh, it's a big portion of the exam, so you definitely want to prepare yourself for this. I would say that you should be more focused on this than the uh, pathology slides. Um, and again, it helps streamline your, your focus because you're focusing on things um, that are contact lens related, right? Not necessarily these crazy pathologies that pop out of nowhere, but things that are related to patients either wearing their lenses um, improperly or just not adapting well to their lenses so it does help you kind of streamline your learning towards those types of problems and always always think of the most simple answer okay so um you don't want to be thinking of weird kind of like obscure diseases and things like that when it comes to the problems think of things like lenses in the wrong eyes uh you know soft lenses are inside out or the lens fell out and that's why they can't see very well anymore they're having issues with solutions or they're having allergic reactions to you know they're having hay fever it's allergy season uh, or maybe they're having allergic reactions to the new solution um they have a foreign body trapped in the lens uh or they're wearing their lenses too much and you know they're suffering from hypoxia and they're having like overwear syndrome kind of things think of the simple things remember sometimes it's important to think of what's the end goal here of this exam to make sure that you are a competent and safe contact lens fitter these are all things that are popping up they won't be test well at least they shouldn't be testing you on recognizing carcinoma or something completely outlandish and obscure like that you want to be able to relate common issues with contact lenses and we just named them you know inserting your lens is wrong inserting a ripped lens um not cleaning them properly having deposits on your lens having you know irritation from those lens deposits from solution problems from allergies these are the things that are going to be coming up in this type of exam uh, this type of you know these types of uh, this section of the exam sorry uh so yeah so focus on those things and as far as the slit lamp portion goes know your illuminations the interesting thing about this and i'm going to tell you something that uh you may not like hearing most opticians use um the the slit lamp like it's like this foreign object uh they look like they're afraid of it get your hands on this thing slide it around move it around the lamp arm should be swinging freely should be doing the things show that you're confident with this thing um the worst thing you can do is take uh, the, 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 the slit lamp and be like, oh, okay. So for this, this illumination, uh, the lamp house has to be at 60 degrees and you look at the protractor and you move it to 60 degrees. And then, uh, it has to be at this magnification. That's like one of my biggest pet peeves in this whole, you know, field when you're teaching opticians to use the slit lamp. A slit lamp is a tool. It's a microscope with a light attached to it so that you can look at the things you want to look at. So f use it freely and openly and, and, and show that you know how to handle this piece of equipment, right? Now, as far as understanding the illuminations, sure, you are going to have to remember, especially for their sake, um, what they're testing. You know, the relative uh, angles at which each illumination should be done, the magnification should be done at, um, you know, but at the end of the day, 
it's all about showing that you can use these things confidently and knowing what those illuminations should be used to see, you know, um, and you know, the, there's plenty of literature out there. There's an entire book on it. Uh, however, you know, I think every student has a little copy of those, um, like a chart, right? That shows every illumination and it shows the angle at which it should be done, the magnification. And it also shows the, uh, the, the common uses just, Memorize that. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of memorization. However, in this case, I think that that's what they're looking for. Therefore, memorize it and be able to and, and be able to demonstrate it and discuss it. Um, and uh, again, don't look like a rookie. Don't look like it's the first time you've touched a slit lamp. Get used to moving it around. The slit lamp is supposed to be operated with two hands on it at all times, one on the joystick and one on the lamp house. You know, get used to holding it like that. Don't just hold it with one arm behind the back and then moving the joystick only. Show confidence with it. If you have an optometrist in your office, sit with them and have watch them use the slit lamp and then mimic what they're doing. Um, don't use it like a rookie. All right. So how about, and, uh, oh yeah, an answer with confidence, of course, you know, sometimes you run into situations in these exams where you're not sure your best answer with confidence. Okay. If you're second guessing yourself and you're, you're unsure, that's far worse. So even if you're not a hundred percent sure on the answer, say it like you mean it. And then, you know, half the time you, you know, the examiner might even not even know it as well, as well as you think they do. And they might just agree with you. So <laughs> that's not my recommendation. Of course, know it right. However, you know, in worst case scenario, Make sure you say it with confidence. Uh, things to review, obviously, you're going to review your, your common contact lens issues that we listed earlier. You're going to look at all the slit lamp illuminations. Um, you're going to think, look at things like direct and indirect. And why would you use direct illumination versus indirect illumination? Remember to understand the difference between direct. Direct is you're looking directly into the light that you're illuminating, whereas indirect is you're bouncing the light off of something and looking at it from kind of backlit, right? So review all those concepts. You don't need me teaching you this in in this particular lecture, uh, it's all pretty straightforward. You just have to review it and memorize it. Remember the magnifications and the angles, although don't lock yourself into these things. Uh, you can even say that during the exam. You know, you can use this angle to this angle. However, I use the lamp house and I move it around in order to get my best view. Remember, the whole idea of the slit lamp is to get the best view possible. If locking it in at a 45 degree angle ain't doing it for you, move it a little bit, right? You need to make the machine do what you want it to do. Not, uh, sorry, make the machine do what you want it to do, not, you know, be at the mercy of locking in particular angles. And tell the examiner that. Tell them that, you know, this is a, a machine that is used fluidly and it's used to get the result you want out of it. Um, and of course, remember the most appropriate uses for those illuminations. Um, you know, there's a lot of general illuminations, you know, most of the direct and indirect and retro and all these different things um, are going to be, and I just realized that I was saying indirect uh, is backlit, retro is backlit. And just in case, <laughs> not to, to kind of ruin a train of thought here, direct is looking into the light, direct is looking a little bit off of the light, retro is looking into the light, or it can be either in or outside of light from a backlit like bouncing the light off the iris or things like that. Just wanted to clarify that so that nobody went on the wrong track. But again, using the most appropriate uses for direct, indirect, retro, uh, conical beam, tangential, things like that. What would you probably use these illuminations for? All right. Um, and good exercises, of course, is uh, to practice on a live model, you know, doing all these things. Have someone who's really, really competent with the slit lamp with you so that they can demonstrate and show you and talk about it. I know we're only two weeks out, so we're running out of time, but this is a good time to get into that and make sure. Have them test you too. And if you don't have a live model a handy, do it on a piece of paper. You're not going to be able to do like things like retro and all these things, but it's still good on a piece of paper or on the calibration rod to kind of practice moving it around a little bit. Um, if you have to come in before hours or after hours and just play around with this thing a little bit so that you get comfortable, I would definitely uh, you know recommend that. Um, and have your colleagues quiz you. You know, um, have them. You know, have the give them the lists. And of course, pick a colleague that's pretty competent with this and say, okay, I want you to now show me a conical beam. I want you to show me scleric scatter. I want you to show me tangential illumination um, and have them have them quiz you the way an examiner would, right? So this is probably your best bet uh, as far as getting ready for the follow-up because the reality is, is that you may not have a lot of patience left in the next two weeks to do all this stuff on. Do it on your colleagues. Put yourself in a situation that mimics the exam. All right, here we are to the conclusion. Uh, if you followed along the whole way, thank you. And I hope that you've gotten some kind of benefits out of this. I know that I haven't gone into detail into every single thing, but at this point, two weeks in, I mean, two weeks out, um, 
I didn't want this to be an eight hour lecture, right? So you're going to have to do some of this kind of the, the searching for some of this information yourself, but I hope that this has given you a little bit of uh, the background that you need and, and maybe ease your nerves a little bit. I hope I didn't create more stress. And again, refer back to the things I talked about uh, previously at the beginning of the last video where this doesn't have to be super stressful. Uh, you know, you got to have some fun with this and you just got to relax a little bit because the stress is going to be worse uh, than the actual exam if you allow it to kind of like creep up and, and get the best of you. So just remember to hang in there. I want to acknowledge, and I think I have a few times, this is super stressful. And I know, I know, you know, this is several years in the making and you want to do well uh, and you can do it. And you know what, even if you feel like you're a little overwhelmed and you're a little stressed and you don't have a lot of time left, two weeks is a lot of time. Um, you still have time to prepare. It's amazing. I've always joked with my students that I could literally teach somebody to pass this exam within a week with with no with no experience and that might be a little ambitious and it's not you know i don't know what that serves other than than just being kind of silly however um you have time it's not like you're starting from scratch you have the background you've been doing this for some time you just need to get kind of you know on track and you have time to prepare and another key thing here is don't compare yourself to others don't say well jimmy over there is so much better at this and i don't i'm not as prepared as they are here's the thing um people flex a lot they show off and you know someone who might sound like they really know what they're doing uh i've been a student for a long time right i i you know i don't talk about it much but i have a whole other career before opticianry uh in academia and i'll tell you one thing um half the people who who act like they know more than you do probably don't and they're probably studying the wrong things and it, it could be very difficult to uh to keep confident when everyone around you seems to know more than you do. So just focus on you. You're the one doing this exam and you're the one who is going to uh, benefit from the results. So don't worry about everyone around you. Just, just focus on yourself. And I know you're going to have this and don't put any extra pressure on yourself. You know, I have to pass this. I have to pass this. You know, everyone's counting on me. I've been doing this for three years. People are going to think I'm dumb if I don't pass. Nobody is going to think that. And if people think you're dumb for not passing this, they're the dummies. You know, this is not this is not an easy exam, especially this year. You haven't had an opportunity to do any of the workshops and things like that. Uh, you know, the cards are up against you, but I know you can do this. And so, you know, just focus on what you can accomplish and don't put any extra pressure on yourself. Um, and again, I've mentioned it before. If, and I know we're getting out of the nitty gritty here, um, however, if you need any extra help, reach out, just reach out to me. Add some, um, add some, uh, some comments to, to the description here because I get notified. So if you do, just kind of put your questions in the comments. It's nice too because others can see the questions um, and I can, I can answer it directly uh, on the um, on the page. Uh, you know, anything. If you have any questions or anything, just make sure you reach out um, and uh, I can, I'll help whatever way I can right up until the day before, right? So uh, again, thank you for sitting through this, you know, almost two hours between the two videos. I hope you found it helpful. And uh, one last thing, you know, um, if you did enjoy what's going on here, uh, and of course, I expect that after you're done with this video, you're going to be passing your exams and be Becoming a licensed professional. However, if you don't mind uh, dropping a like on the video and also subscribing to the channel, because uh, you guys are going to become mentors now, right? Like this is you're two weeks away from becoming a professional. Now you're the next cohort of professionals, and you're you're going to have students and stuff too. So I'd love for you to uh, stay as part of the modern optician community and you know consuming the the content we put out and even recommending it to students and colleagues that you have in the future so anyways um once again good luck with your exams i know you're going to do really really well um and i know it's going to be a great experience no matter what happens so once again have you know good luck and uh i hope to hear from you soon all right bye now